I want to talk about a sower, um, some seed, and the soil. That's what I want to talk about. And how we're going to present this to you is like this. Um, we're going to review the first parable they feel that it was from Jesus. Um, and it's a parable, one of the very few parables. And what's a parable? A like parable a, is what? Like a story? It's a short story used to teach you. That's what yeah. a parable is. Jesus uses a parable in the Bible. It's one of the first. Um, it's, it's, uh, it's been argued at this point, but they feel that it's the first parable uh, that Jesus had and shared, which is a, it's, um, it's got to mean something powerful for us today. So in starting uh, this message, I want to read what Jesus says. And then we're going to talk about how it applies to you and some goals that we can make as a church. Okay, so some goals we can make as a church. What I'd like to do is give this again in Spanish and um, so that the Spanish brothers uh, um, can be um, in unison with this idea that our job and our journey here in the church is not just to exist. Uh, the church was not formed just to exist or make you feel better. The church should be a beehive of activity yeah. and growth. It's where the Holy Spirit of God comes upon and helps change people. It's where messages and testimonies are made in a church. And so we want to see the type of growth that Jesus is talking about with productive seed here in the church and how we can do that we're going to have some some suggestions today and some ideas and we're going to work together on those so let's say a prayer together we're going to ask that god's spirit be with us for the next few minutes um, hopefully this will be a powerful powerful story and then i'd like to sing a song with you and then we'll go ahead and close out and pray we'd love to pray for you we've been missing you we really have um, the holy spirit holy spirit's been so um so strong here and there's so much, uh, both in the Spanish and, and here in the English, the potential for God's Spirit of, of reaching out um, and, and helping that seed fertilize is powerful. So let's read together uh, after we pray. Dear God, we want to approach you this afternoon. We, we, we know we are strengthened by you, God. We pray that your Spirit will be with the message as it goes out and it's shared to others so that we can, we can make it a personal um, goal of ours to, to be in line as, as sowers uh, sharing seed uh, so that you could grow in the hearts of those that will respond. We leave this message in these verses in your care and in your hands in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Okay. We're going we're gonna to read this in Luke's uh, in, in Luke's um, um, inspiration in his words in Luke. Uh, this is also shared in some of the other Gospels. Luke chapter 8 and verse 14. And this is what, uh, what we read together. Okay. Luke chapter 8 and verse 5. Verse 4, we'll start there. Um, when, and when many people were gathered together, when many people were gathered together, people... Um, from all over came together. They were come to him out of every city. So a large group is developing around Jesus. And then he begins to speak. And in verse 5, this is what he says. <clears throat> a sower went out to sow his seed, and he sowed. Some fell by the wayside, and it was trodden down, and the fowls of the air devoured it. And some fell upon a rock, and as soon as it was sprung up, it withered away because it lacked moisture. And some fell among thorns, and the thorns sprang up with it and choked it up. And others fell upon good ground and sprang up and bore fruit a hundredfold. And when he had said these things, he cried, He that has ears, hear. Let him hear. That's what Jesus said to the crowd. And his disciples said, What might this parable be? And he said to them, Unto you it is given 
to know the mysteries of the kingdom of God. But to others in parables, that seeing they might not see, and hearing they might not understand. Now this is the parable. It is this, Jesus said. It is this. The seed is the word of God. The seed is the word of God. Those by the wayside are they that hear. Then cometh the devil, and taketh away the word out of their hearts, lest, lest they should believe and be saved. They are the rock. Are they who, when they hear, receive the word with joy? And these have no root, and for a while believe, and in time of testing, they fall away, they swoop away. And that which fell among thorns are those who, when they've heard, they go forth, and they're choked with cares and riches and pleasures of life, and bring no fruit to perfection. But that on the good news are they who in an honest and good heart have heard the word, they keep it, and bring forth fruit with patience. Those are the verses today. Now, um, when we read the verses from Jesus, the parable, he describes the parable to us, and somewhere in there you fell. Didn't you? Uh, you fall into the, those, that group. Somehow, it could be you. You could find yourself one who doesn't respond at all. Or you could find, be one who responds and then falls away. Or you could be one who just, ah, oh, that's what the good news does to you. However it is, we're affected. You could be one at one point and another at another point, right? And that's what happens to us. Um, this is a powerful story. Now imagine um, if what happened back then in, in 30 uh, AD, if it happened today, Jesus, the Son of God, multitudes of people sees his miracles, multiple, with walks on water. He feeds thousands with little, right? Um, thousands of people who come back, he, uh, he, he feeds them, he satisfies them. He's crucified and is in a tomb that was guaranteed by the finest soldiers found anywhere in the world. And the same man predicted three days later that he would rise physically from the dead. Cameras would have been everywhere watching, trying to figure out what happened to him. But the cameras weren't there then. Reporters would have been on the scene 24 hours, all the time, trying to figure out what's the next step. And yet, without a doubt, when they did arrive, according to the stories and the history, the stones rolled away. The tomb is empty, and 11 of his most devoted followers claim he was raised from the dead. Now, in this day and age, with social media and television and the internet, uh, globalization, um, the population of the world would have heard the fantastic news and they would have had a hard time not believing it, right? They would have had a hard time because they would have had to see it. And that's what happens to us nowadays. We have to see it to believe it. And, and there's a way to see almost everything that happens today. Uh, the problem is that it didn't happen today. It happened 2,000 years ago. So how is God going to get the news out now? How is he going to do it? It happened so long ago. Will he send legion of angels? Uh, having them ready to go. Legions of them. He could have done that. Uh, to the four corners of the earth. And proclaim good news to them. So all can hear it? Is that what he would have done? Huh? God could just paint the news in the sky and leave it there 24 hours a day and people say ooh wow and they will believe that something amazing happened so that they could know about Jesus and learn about Jesus no it's not what God that's not what God did God again does the unthinkable and the inconceivable and almost illogical thing he entrusts his people, beginning with 11 of them, and then his followers. And that could be you off down to our time today. You could be one of the ones that has to get out with the news so everyone can hear it. Yeah. Uh, now, people use different terms to describe that job. One term is an evangelist. Another term is share your faith. Another term is proclaim the gospel. But for many, if not most, followers of Jesus, it is the most difficult part of your Christian life. It's 
to share it. And I've learned the hard way. I've taken on a lot of responsibility that it's not easy. And it's not easy to share it sometimes with people you love. Uh, let's be honest. We know that we need to do it. We know that we ought to do it. We know that others need us to do it. But the truth is the vast majority of followers never do it. And those who do do it don't feel like they're doing enough or they're doing it right. They get stressed out when they're doing it. They feel guilty when they're not doing it. Somehow, we've convinced ourselves that the only seminary trained preachers, they're the only ones that should do it. And we just come to church, and we enjoy church. We just need to understand one part in doing it. <coughs> one part in doing it. And to that end, Jesus tells the story. And without understanding the story, the church will never grow ever. It will just sit there with the same people forever because there's no seeds going out. And the only one that gets to enjoy Christ is you. We've got to do the work. And so Jesus tells a story like he often did. A parable. A parable. It was one of his favorite ways of preaching, you remember. And in Luke, as we read, he tells us what may be the most important of all the parables he ever taught. He, he told about 40 parables, but this is the first time he ever spoke in a parable. Of the 40 parables he told, this is the only one of two that has a title. A title! And it's only one of three that Jesus himself felt was so important to understand it that he did what? It's so important that he didn't just tell a story, he did what? He interpreted you the story. Don't miss this. That's what Jesus did. He wants you to get it. So it is the only one that is found in all the three Gospels. Matthew, Mark, Luke. And all three, it is a, the first of the parables that Jesus told. It is not a foundation parable. It's actually a parable about all the parables. And that makes it pretty powerful. The story is simple. So we're going to talk about it for a few minutes and then we're going to go our separate ways. We're going to take this message, if we can, to somebody, somehow. Amen. It's about a farmer. The Bible calls him a sower. A man sows. We don't know if he was a farmer. He, he could have been uh, working at the grocery store. I don't know. The Bible says some translations have thrown in the word farmer, but he was a seller. Could have been anybody. Could have been the, ba uh, the baker of bread. I don't know. <laughs> the sower is the follower of Jesus. The sower. It's very simple. He goes out to the field and sows seed. He sows so much seed that seed falls all over. It falls on different ground. And have you ever had that happen to you where you're sharing the message and you feel nothing from them? Or they're disrespectful about God? The end truth of the parable is simply this. The quality of the soil determines, determines whether or not the planting of the seed produces a harvest. So what determines whether there's a response? The soil, right? That's what it is. It's not the sower, the seed. It's not that guy, right? It's, if we're going to see positive things and growth, we're going to see what? We're going to see a solid soil, right? A good soil. It's not the planting of the seed that produces a harvest. Here are, here are, now, of course, planting's involved. We don't want to forget it. There are three parts to this story. The sower, the seed, and the soil. We know what these three represent because Jesus tells us. The sower is the follower of Jesus. The seed is the word of God. The soil is the heart of the person. The heart, the heart of the person that needs to hear the gospel. Keep that in mind. 
Keep that in mind through our discussion. A large crowd gathers out. People from all over come to Jesus. A crowd. From town after town. And he tells them this parable. A farmer went out. He sows his seed. As he was scattering the seed, some fell here, some fell there. Some was trampled on, right? Birds ate it up. Some fell on rocky ground. When it came up, it withered, right? Had no moisture there. Other seed fell among the thorns, which grew uh, grew with it, and it choked the plants with the thorns growing so close. Still other seed fell on good soil, and it came up and it yielded a crop. Uh, and then he finished with this, and he calls it out to the crowd, and he screams out to them, right? Whoever has ears, hear this! I don't know if you can hear it, or if you're listening to it. Now it's very obvious in the focus of the parable, it is not the sower. He's not even, we don't even know who he is, right? It says the sower, a sower. He's a sower. We don't know who he is, he's not identified. It's the seed, is, it, is that the focus of the story, is the seed? Well, the seed is what? It's, it's scattered. Yes. Scattered. Simple. You scattered around. That's not the focus. Um, uh, it's not on the seed, it's scattered. The focus is on the soil, which is the only variable in the story. The sower doesn't change. The seed doesn't change. The only thing that changes is the soil. Uh, whether or not that seed brings a harvest is not determined by the sower, the smooth-talking preacher, or, or that great evangelist that's, you know, walking the streets. That's not, it's helpful, right? He's sowing, he's seeding. But that's not what's cultivating the fruit of these seeds. Whether or not the seed brings a harvest is not determined by the sower of the seed, but the soil. It is not the messenger. It is not the message. It is the heart of the person who hears God. That's the great news for you, whoever you are, if you want to do the work of the Lord. This is the best news in the world. You know why? Because what you have to do is pretty simple, right? Because what really matters is what? The heart. All you have to do is seed, right? It's very powerful. Simply put, here's the sermon in a sentence. We are to go and sow, and the rest is up to God. In other words, we're to do our part, but only God can reach the heart. We're to do our job. We're to go and sow, right? And leave the results to God. Hopefully and prayerfully, once we understand how this works, we will get involved in a work knowing we will all have some success. Some success. You'll have some success if you're doing the work. We are responsible to be sowers. We are to sow the seed. There's no misunderstanding of what Jesus means in this story. He begins to tell us in his own words. This is the meaning. That's what he says. So don't miss it. Don't miss it. The seed is God's word. That's the seed. Now the seed is the word of God. And don't miss the fact that even though the seed is the word of God, the seed cannot plant itself. Do you get that point? The seed is the word of God. You would think God could snap his fingers and the word just goes. No. Even though it's the word of God, it needs, it needs what? Even though the seed is the word of God, the seed cannot plant itself. It needs a sower. Guess who that is? It's you. You're the sower. I'm the sower. We sow it. All the seed in the world is useless if the sower doesn't go. 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 The sower's got to go. All the church in the world, go. Go. It doesn't do any good, and there's not going to be any growth if you don't what? Go. 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 You gotta, the 
sower hath the seed. Uh, one thing we do know for sure that if there is no sowing and there is no seed, there's definitely no growth. Amen. Amen. So we have to go. Um, that is this. The fisherman can't do his job on land. He has to go to the water. We're not, we are not to let God's word that sit on a shelf and rot. We're not to keep it to ourselves. That is, what does that mean if you keep it to yourself? That means this right here. Go to church. You hear it and you leave it at church. And you don't take it anywhere else. You don't see it everywhere. You don't do anything about it. We have seed brought, bought and paid for us. All we have to do is sow it. We just have to sow it. You can even have the most fertile soil in the world. You can plow that soil, soften that soil, fertilize the soil, and weed that soil. But that soil will not do you any good if, if you don't sow it. It can have the best fertile ground here in Wapato. But if we're not sowing seed here in our community, nothing's going to happen. I don't, I, don't, I don't want you to discount the power in that single statement I just said. The power of it. Uh, do you understand the power that we all have in the gospel? The power that you have that you've been given that you're holding in your hands the most powerful seeds in the world of truth. You have them. Uh, do you know where trees come from? They come from tiny little seeds, no bigger than a seed that can produce a tomato or a watermelon. In that one seed, that one seed can produce that one sequoia, when it matures to almost 400,000 seeds on its own every single year. The power in that one seed of a sequoia compared to the power of the gospel is like comparing a spark to the sun. In that seed that you hold, hi sister, in that seed that you hold ah, in your hand is the power to not just change a life, internally or to change a situation in someone's life externally but to change their life eternally eternally what matters in this parable is not that the sower scattered the seed but that he did what it, it's not it's not how the sower scattered the seed right it's not how he did it but what what's the most important point of this discussion I want you to learn it's not how he did it. It's why. Okay, why is it important, right? Because he knows it's the word of God. Yeah. So it's not how or why. It's the purpose. It's that he is doing it. Oh. Right? He could know it's the word of God. Right? He could have some great ways to do it. In his mind, maybe. But if he's not doing it, it's no good. Right? So what matters in the story is not how he's doing it, but that he does it. Sowing seed is a, is it a high-tech operation to sow a seed? Is it a high-tech thing to sow a seed? If you're going to sow a seed, you think it's difficult? A seed can be a big seed, right? You've ever planted a flower that's a big seed? You're like, wow, that's a small flower for a big seed. Right? Yeah. <laughs> but then have you ever seen a seed like we're talking about with a sequoia? That seed is so tiny, you can almost barely see it. And yet that tree will grow in, like a monster, right? Wow. The point is, take a big bag of seed. And you walk around and you throw it all over. You throw it down. There's no bad way to sow it. Just sow it. I've got a spot in my house that I want wild flowers to grow. So in the spring, I take a handful of seeds and I throw them in there. And I may get maybe five flowers out of that handful of seeds. Right? Mm -hmm. But five of those seeds found good soil. Mm -hmm. But if I never put 
no seeds in there, I won't get anything out of it. Remember the focus of this whole story is not the sower and it's not the seed. But on what? The soil. The soil. The soil. The soil. The soil. It's not how you do it or what you're doing to do it. It's not the seed. We know what the seed is. What is what changes in the story? The soil. The soil. The soil. The soil, the soil is changing. That's what changes. We, we don't want to walk away from understanding this. Some are going to hit hard ground. Some are going to hit rocky ground. Some are going to hit thorny ground. There's some people that we love. Some people come into our lives that will have nothing to do with God. It's rocky, right? Some will hit ground good. They'll hit it good. But it didn't take you skill to plant the seed or throw it out there. You didn't need special training or education to sow it. But you did it. It might have even taken a while. Some pastors will pastor for... For 20 years, and then someone will walk in that they've been working on for 20 years. I heard a story this morning about that. The point is that we, we, we throw the seed. We throw it. What matters isn't how the seed is sown, but that it's sown. And this is why. Because it is not the expertise that you bring to the table, or me. It's not. It is simply the quality of the soil. You have nothing to do with it. The soil, God gives you the seeds. It's the soil. If you want a church to grow, you got to plant seeds. You don't plant seeds, nothing's going to happen in the church. Uh, because it's not the expertise of the sower, it is simply the quality of the soil and the people of, of the power of seed that determines the harvest. Our part is simply to do what? To do it. Go. Do it. Go, go, go! You know someone that's having a hard time in their life and they come to you and you don't say anything about God? What are you doing? How long has it been since you've been to church? We need to pray over you. Can you come to church? There's your seed. And yeah, there's your seed, right? Somebody asks you how you're doing, you say, you know what? So many things have happened to me this last year, but you know what? I found this church that's just changed me. There's your seed. But you got to go. If you don't go, then it doesn't matter how good the soil is. It's the power of the seed and the soil and the sower. That's where growth comes from. Remember the focus of this whole story is what? The soil. The soil. Uh, the best sower of the best seed will not see any fruit if there's bad soil. Jesus said these soils as the hearts are the hearts of people and we're trying to reach them. Of all the seed that I've sown um, there are Four kinds of soil, and Jesus describes them here. Four kinds of soil. Do you know what makes God, the Word of God, different from every other book that you are ever going to read? You can read every other book with your eyes and, and hear every other book with your ears, but you receive God's Word with what? The Holy Spirit. My heart. Your heart. It's the only one where your heart's involved. We have to accept this. Eternal message. It's the only book like it. You can read every other book. But with the Bible, you receive God's word, the word, through your heart. Your heart is called the path. People would walk through fields and they would basically take the same path they were going. And as they walk along, the path would do what? They would trample down different paths in the grass. The path would be actually on the field where you would plant, but it would be on the edge of the field like curbsides or, or roadsides. You would plant, but it would be on the edge of the field like the curbside or roadside. It is where the birds would, would look for the food. In other words, this was the type of soil where the seed could not get on. The birds would eat them up, whatever that soil was that would represent those hearts. Then Jesus talks about a second kind of heart. 
Because this, the soil is what? The soil represents the heart. So these are where you're throwing your seeds out at people. You don't know what the heart is. You're just throwing seeds out at them. Okay? So here's the other kind of heart. The second kind of heart. Those where the seeds fall on rocky ground are the ones who receive the word with joy when they hear it. Uh, but they have no root. No root. They believe in a while. Um, but in, the, in time of testing, they do what? Just fall away. away. Fall away. Okay. Maybe we've been had that happen to us. I think probably most of us have had that happen to us at one one time, where we didn't allow the seed to root right. Okay. Okay. That's that's the second kind of heart. All right. Did this ever happen to to God's own nation in the Bible? This is what happened to Israel, right? Mm -hmm. So what happened to them? We have people that, that will come back to our table, back to our table, back to the church. Then they want to get baptized. They want to do more in the church. Maybe at one point the seed didn't get on that good soil. And the seed didn't get in just right. Okay. Okay, now there's a third soil Jesus talks about. Jesus describes part three. The seed that fell among the thorns stands for all those who hear. But as they, as they go on their way, they're choked out by what? What chokes them out? The thorns, right? It says it, it, it falls on the thorns, so when it grows out, the thorns choke them out. What did that represent? What did Jesus say it represented? You remember? He said, these are the ones who are choked out by life's worries, riches, pleasures, and they do not mature. How many uh, do you think in the, in the Christian church, how many do you think of the majority that would be? I, I, I think myself, I think that's a lot. Like a majority. And here's why. I believe a lot of people are believers. I talk to a lot of people who believe in Christ, who believe in God. Some people come to church. But when it comes right down to really commitment, what happens? So we had to talk about this the other day. A message went out on priority. Where does God come in their life? Five. Right? Two. There's only one right place when it comes to God. It should be number one. So that happens a lot where all these other things, and I'm going to say them again because this is probably happening to you. Okay? And it's a test for every single one of us in the church. Every one of us is a test. And that is this. Are we like those who have received this seed? Is our hearts like this? Where God's word, the seed, is choked out by worry. Or it's choked out by riches. Or it's choked out by pleasures. It's not easy to keep going. It's not easy to, to maintain your commitment to God. These things just choke it out. They, they choke you out and they never mature. And then that seed does what? What happens to the seed? dies. Yeah. Could be we're just steps away from death in our Christian life. Now the first soil, the seed didn't go on. The second soil, the seed couldn't get down in, right? The third soil, the seed couldn't get out. The gospel gets choked out by all kinds of stuff. Financial responsibility, worldly amusements. It's not. He's not real to them. It, or, or he is real to them, and they just don't feel he's relevant. What's the word? They don't feel that he's he's relevant anymore. Maybe they're too busy in their life. Could be. These are the people who hear the word of God, and they say they want to follow the Son of God. And then other things. The golf course. <laughs> the lake house. The bigger checks. The corporate ladder. Keeps getting in the way. Uh, and there are other things. Uh, you probably thought of things that are affecting you. There are things that affect me. We're tested. There are other people who don't have those things. But because they want them so badly, they get in the way of their commitment. Their Christian feel like that is why you see so often people who hit it big in the sports world or the entertainment world or the financial world and then they forget where they come from. Have you ever seen that happen? Mm -hmm. uh, they forget where they come from. That happens to us. At this point, you may be discouraged and say, good grief, 
What is the use of sowing seed at all? But the seed on good soil stands for those with a noble and good heart who hear the word, retain it, and by persevering, produce the crop. That's, that's the seed that we want to focus on. There is a heart that doesn't just hear God's word, it heeds God's word. It doesn't just receive the gospel, it responds to the gospel, it retains it. It reproduces the gospel, it takes root. That's a seed that takes root. That's that good soil of the heart. Uh, listen to this carefully what I'm going to tell you. There are more than a few people who make what we call a profession of faith. They come to church every Sunday. They profess it. And they think because they walk down the aisle of church or they fill out the visitor card or they say a group prayer or a prayer or even they get baptized or even attend the church, they feel they're saved. And I want to tell you, you could find yourself in a very serious situation and position with Christ. If you're not taking seriously your decision for Christ, your decision for Him, are you saved by surrendering your life to Jesus? Well, we know what the Bible says, that you have to do that. And it doesn't matter whether I, I think you're saved or not, whether you think I am saved or not. What matters is that both of us should be able to look in the mirror and know that we are saved. We are if you're going to look in the mirror, are you saved? That's what matters. Not just by something we say, something we sign, by something we, you know, uh, but by the fruit that we bear. When that seed took root, let me be clear, we are not saved by works. Religious activity, moral life, we're saved. Uh, if we are saved, every one of those things will follow. We expect to see those things. Good works don't produce salvation, but good works do prove salvation. There are people that we will lead to Jesus and, and they will mean it. They will bear that fruit. Their lives will be changed. And you don't have to ask them. They show you them. They show you that. Uh, we have people right here in our groups of church, in the Spanish and English, our church who serve. There could be people who go to mission trips. They do all their tithe. Uh, they build great homes and wonderful families. But when you watch them, you see them bearing fruit that is forever ripe. And it never rots. It leads to the last thing we must remember in our discussion. This should take any pressure off of you in sharing your faith. So the purpose of this discussion is to help you to see that there is a need for you to sow seed. We all want this church to grow. Remember, all a farmer can do is sow the seed. Once he does that, the harvest is in what? It's in God's hands. God's hands. Our job is to go. Go. Sow. Leave it all to God. And I'm going to share uh, with you two sentences that I hope will change your attitude towards taking this seed in your hand and then sowing it. Okay? I want you to think about this. I want you to be a part of this. The key to reaching people without Jesus is not the presentation of the message. Do you hear that? You say, well, that's not right, because the Bible says you, you would go preach. That's our job. Well, that's true. We do have to preach the message. I'm going to read it again to you. The key to reaching people without Jesus is not the presentation of the message. It's not the way you speak, or the clothes you wear, or what culture you come from. It's not your presentation. It is the penetration of the heart. The presentation is our part, and we are nothing. Humble yourselves before God. The penetration is God's part. Let me tell you why all of us can be successful in doing this work. What God has commanded and called you to do, He's called you to do it. 
You are the sowers. You are the sowers. Uh, he's called us, every one of us, to do it. Success is simply doing what? Your success. Your success. Your success is simply doing what? It's simply doing what? Spreading the seeds of God. Planting the seeds. Sowing. Sowing. Go. Sow. Have you ever had a conversation with someone you didn't say anything about Jesus and you wish you would have? Yes. Right? I've done that. I have a conversation later on. I'm saying, you know what? I really tried to help them, but I, I didn't mention Jesus. What? Our job is to sow. That's what we're supposed to be doing. And every time you drop a seed, you, you're successful. Every time you drop a seed, because all you're told to do is be the sower. You have to sow. You're not always going to plant a tree, a Christian tree. But that's part of your planting, is to make that distinction, right? Uh, every time you drop a seed, you are a success, church. If you are sharing what you know, and if you are living what you share, that is all that God asks you. You can sow and have no harvest. Uh, church, you could sow and not have a harvest. And that is proven in the parable. But let me tell you one thing, even more certain than that, even more certain than that. If you don't sow, church, you will never see the harvest. That's the truth. If we don't sow at all, there's not going to be a harvest at all. <clears throat> to be clear, there is no power in that little card or that invitation. There's no power in it. There is a wonder-working power in the message of that little card or that pamphlet. There is no power in the card, but there's power in the message and the word. So I just want to close with this thought. I think we made it. I think we made it to this point. <laughs> uh, the God that created the universe has decided to make you a partner in his company. You think about that? He's decided to make you a partner in his company, which has the greatest mission in the world, giving people the gift of eternal life. He wants you. of giving the one message from the one master that can bring help to helpless, hopeless people and heal them. Heal the hurting. Help the helpless. Give hope to the hopeless. The reward for being God's partner is off the charts. And all God asks you to do... Right? So... Start sowing your seeds. The church feels really good to us, but if we keep sowing seeds, we'll watch it feel good to others. Right? The reward of being God's partner is off the charts, and all of God, all He asks us to do is drop them. Drop the seeds. Go. Drop the seeds. And that's our final thought. Sign yourself up, because you can do it too. Don't worry about your, your presentation. God's going to evaluate the soil. You just put the seeds out there. Amen. 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 We're making little cards. They're going to be welcome cards. One side's going to be Spanish, and one side's going to be English. And we're going to have them here in the church so that everybody can, everybody can have these cards. And it could be a seed for you. If you're out in a restaurant and someone seems to be having a hard time, give them a card. Tell me you'd like to see in the church. Because it, it, it is part of your message. And then God starts doing a work in their heart. Amen. So let's be the workers that God has pulled us into.